Hello and welcome to season two of Invest in Progress. I'm Claire Shaw, a director and investment specialist in the Scottish Mortgage Team. In this podcast, we aim to take you behind the scenes to hear the conversations that take place between the Scottish mortgage managers and the visionary leaders of some of the world's most exceptional growth companies. As we are a UK investment trust, we can only market Scottish mortgage to certain audiences and in certain jurisdictions. Check out the podcast description to ensure this content is suitable for you. And as with any investment, your capital is at risk. So you may be listening to this podcast in the car, on a bus or in a taxi, struggling through a congested commute. And we know that road vehicles are a massive contributor to pollution in city centres. So what if there was a way to reduce urban congestion and provide an alternative mode of transport, which is greener, quieter and quicker? So welcome to Joby Aviation, a company at the forefront of transforming the way we travel. Joby has developed an electric aircraft that it plans to operate as a commercial taxi service in the sky. And today we will be joined by Paul Schiara, the executive chairman of Joby. So before we welcome Paul, I'm here with Scottish mortgage manager, Tom Slater. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. So a few of our listeners might be thinking right now, are we talking about flying cars here? You know, this sounds like something from a sci-fi film. So how should we think about this company? You know, when I think about Joby, my frame of reference is almost this Uber of the skies. You know, am I on the right track here? How would you describe this company? Well, I think in a way we are talking about flying cars. Um, I think it's just really exciting to see this idea from from science fiction um, becoming a commercial reality. What we're talking about in modern parlance is eVTOLs or electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. And what the, what they're doing is um, is is basically taking the, the confluence of a number of, of technology trends and using it to enable a completely new form of transportation, um, which has the potential to deliver on the promise of the helicopter, but that the, the helicopter failed to, to deliver on for a number of reasons, one of which is that they're extremely loud. Um, and it makes them very impractical to operate in urban areas. Um, and the other of which is that, that you have these pieces of metal um, flying around at about head height at hundreds of miles an hour, which people find very scary and off-putting. Um, and, I, and I think the eVTOL form factor um, um, addresses those, those big shortcomings of, of helicopter aviation. Great. Well, Tom, after your chat with Paul, it'll be your turn to be in the hot seat. I'll be asking you a bit more about our investment case for Joby Aviation. But until then, I'll hand over to you and Paul. Thanks, Paul, for for joining me. Wonderful to be here, Tom. Thanks a lot for making the time, too. It's certainly not quite as nice a setting as the the last time we spoke. It was a nice summer's afternoon in uh, in Idaho, but yeah, uh, well, we'll we'll make this do nonetheless. For the listeners that don't know, can you tell us what is Joby Aviation? So, Tom, Joby is the leading developer and soon operator of all electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. So you can think about these as aircraft that take off and land like a helicopter, but fly like traditional aircraft. Fully electric in terms of both its propulsion and its energy, delivering uh, a quiet, fast, and green aerial transportation for trips anywhere between zero and 100 miles. Before I ask more about the company, um, can we focus on, on you for a minute? People might be um, surprised by your unconventional route into Joby because in, in 2008, you co-founded Pinterest, a software company, consumer internet company. You were president and, and CEO there for a long period of time. And then in 2014, you became executive chairman of Joby. So what sparked your interest in Joby? Talk us through that journey. Yeah, so yeah, the... The timeline of Pinterest, so we founded that, Ben and I founded that company back in 2008 um, and, you know, was obviously very excited about the sort of trajectory that the company was on, um, but sort of knew at some level um, that there was other things for me to do. And just around that period, it was the moment, I think just before the launch of the Model S, where I think Tesla was showing what was possible um, with electric vehicles on the ground. 
But the question for me was what other areas of transportation have the opportunity to be impacted by that? And maybe one of the obvious leaps was to aviation. But it was a it was it was a really it felt like an important moment um, uh, in terms of this kind of big shift. And this felt like an important white space that at that point was not being sort of sufficiently explored. And I think that was really the sort of spark of the interest that I had in the category. You know, surveying the market at that point, there were not many folks that were working on this. <laughs> It is only now, sort of 10 years after, um, that there are a large number of companies that are, are, are sort of working on the category, but it was very much a backwater. What about for you personally? I mean, you you come from being based in, in downtown San Francisco, working in a in a high velocity software company to, you know, you're, you're out in the sticks working on this project that was 10 years to become a reality. That must have required really quite a big mindset shift. Yeah. I. I it, it certainly did, but in many ways, I mean, from a very personal standpoint, I think it was a it was a good thing. It is very easy um, to essentially fall into recreating what you've done before, and I can say that for me, you know, I I, I nearly did it. Um, you know, had a, had an idea for another uh, consumer internet company, a small team, like was sort of ready to go on that. But it felt for me that it would have been in many ways sort of fighting a battle that I'd already fought. So there was something both challenging, but also very exciting about taking on something that was very different. Just what what was the problem that you saw Joby was trying to solve? I think you can take that on, 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 on two different levels. Um, so on one hand, it was, look, can you build a, 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 an interesting... Um, that is sort of interesting for consumers, um, fully electric aircraft. Um, and then the second question is, how could you ensure that it was delivering, you know, real value to end consumers on the other side? So the question that, that we sort of pushed was, let's think about something that can have even wider applicability. But that would mean, in turn mean an aircraft that had a pilot on seat, in turn, a number of passengers sitting behind and could be used for something that looked a lot like an aerial Uber. I should add that, you know, when we think about what Joby Aircraft can deliver, it's about getting people to where they want to go uh, faster. And one of the fundamental problems, um, at least in the developed world, making that happen is an inability um, to build new infrastructure new bridges, new roads, new tunnels. The costs are astronomical, whether it's here in the US or in Europe. Um, so one of the promises of aviation as a sector in terms of electrifying is that it doesn't require um, that same fixed ground infrastructure that has been so difficult um, to build. So that's why it felt like an important area to focus on, both in terms of its impact by this change to electric and also its ability to deliver something that was really differentiated from a transportation standpoint. So c- can we go back to those those very early days when you joined? Um, you, there was, I think, five employees at that time. You were working in the mountains near Santa Cruz. So just, just tell us a bit more about that time, what the challenges that you were faced as you started to build the company from the, the ground up. But I will say, uh, before I get to the challenges, I will say the benefits. Um, We had a small and sort of very passionate team that had already done some very groundbreaking work in many of the components that have been necessary to build this aircraft over time. So the, the, the sort of technical grounding of the team was really strong. I think the big question um, at that point, and certainly some of the key challenges were one, what is the right form factor? How do we make the right progress against our eventual end goals um, to uh, credibly de-risk it and in turn fund the business over time? And those were some of the things that I think were were the biggest challenges. So going to electric not only has an opportunity to reduce operating costs, obviously limit the carbon footprint, 
reduce the noise of aircraft, which is critically important for getting high frequency, high density operations in and around cities. But it also allowed for aircraft designs that simply were not possible when you started with a turbine. So for for our listeners that are, are struggling to to visualize what what the aircraft looks like, can can you just talk talk people through you know, what what the product looks like, how it works? Sure. So uh, the fundamental design is something called uh, a tilt rotor. Um, so maybe the closest sort of equivalent is the military aircraft, the Osprey, the V twenty two. But our aircraft is, is different from that. So it is a fuselage with a wing and then six propellers distributed, two on either wing and then in turn two on the tail. Those translate from 90 degrees, so upward facing during takeoff and land, and then tilt down to zero degrees as it moves from vertical takeoff and landing mode to forward flight configuration. We knew that in order to get to ranges that were interesting from a consumer standpoint, we would have to take on some of those technical challenges of transitioning. And that was part of the reason, Tom, why we were careful in the early days to work through subscale versions and then an initial full scale version to ensure that we had the right aerodynamics and in turn the right controls to make that transition not only possible, but comfortable for passengers that would be seated in the aircraft. But I take a lot of comfort in the fact that now, 10 years later, the vast majority of the companies that are thinking about this space, both big and small, have in many ways converged on the same sort of aircraft that we started with 10 years ago. So let's talk about that, that perspective of the passenger. And if I land at, at, at JFK Airport in, in New York, it's gridlock. You know, how, how do I book a Joby Air taxi? Where do I go? How long will the journey take? Yeah, so... That was actually a sort of, sort of, we call it sort of a hero route, one of these sort of critical routes that we sort of had in mind from uh, the very beginning. So it's an absolutely great example. So let's imagine you're getting off your Delta flight. Um, you may have already booked, in conjunction with your commercial flight, your trip on a Joby from JFK to Manhattan in turn to your hotel. Um, so you get off the Delta flight, you're directly onto your Joby vehicle. We're flying the, you know, 10 minute sort of 10 mile um, flight to Manhattan. And there's an Uber car waiting at the Vertiport location to take you directly to your hotel. Um, So we want to try to build something that is really seamless between these different modes of transportation, because that's the thing that is going to save passengers the most time and deliver the most value. You know, you, you're going to be flying these these vehicles over highly populated areas. What what does the safety profile look like of the vehicle? It, should should people be worried about the deployment of this technology? So we started with sort of safety as the number one goal, and it began actually with the overall aircraft design, Tom. So the reason for six propellers is to create redundancy, a redundancy that you don't see in the V twenty two, for example, or certainly with helicopters. We wanted to ensure that there were zero single points of failure. So in forward flight configuration, as many as four of those propellers can fail and you can still maintain nominal flight. But this question, maybe the broader question of not just certification, but public acceptance was also on our mind too. Um, So we tried to design the aircraft to have touchstones that felt familiar to people. So car style doors instead of traditional helicopter style doors feels like getting into and out of an SUV as opposed to climbing over the wing of a small aircraft. Um, We wanted to give people a sense that, hey, this was something familiar, even if it was obviously something that was very unfamiliar in terms of what it could actually deliver. Could you talk about where in the world you might start to deploy this first? And and then I guess the other question that that the example prompted for me was, is is this going to be an expensive luxury um, you know, for first class air passengers coming into into JFK or or where do you where do you see the the demand coming from? Sure. So um, to your question on markets, this has been a, a a key focus of the company, especially over the last year. As we get closer and closer to FA certification, as we've begun to actually scale production, now a lot of our attention has been shifted to 
what are the right markets to commercialize in? How do we build the right route network? And what are the right partner set in those cities to make it as successful as possible post-launch? Um, so we haven't named individual cities yet, but we have indicated um, that we are very much focused on New York, LA, and South Florida here in the US as some of the first potential markets for the service um, for reasons that will probably be obvious to your listeners, um, significant density, lots of traffic, and uh, an opportunity to deliver significant time savings to consumers from day one. To your second question, Tom, on cost, we designed the aircraft specifications with a pretty simple equation. We wanted to maximize the number of passenger seat miles that we could deliver per given unit of time. That pushes us to an aircraft that has greater capacity than say the two seats that we may have started with, so four passengers, a faster speed, and minimal charge time. Those are the ingredients that get you the highest sort of passenger throughput. And what that does is that allows you to amortize your fixed and variable costs over a larger number of seats and drive down the cost point over time. All that said, we do expect that in the early days, we're gonna be aircraft limited um, and it will probably begin as a premium service or at least premium price relative to ground transportation. But we tried to be thoughtful to ensure that through manufacturing scale, through operational efficiencies in each individual market, we'd be able to drive that price point down over time to get to something that was progressively more affordable to larger and larger numbers of people. But even from day one, um, you should consider uh, this as something that is probably an order of magnitude cheaper than a helicopter. And you've made phenomenal progress with the aircraft. What about the infrastructure that you need to build to support a, a commercial service? You know, what, what, a, you know, what, what, what do you need to build you know, what what are the what are the opportunities and challenges there? We designed the aircraft to fit in essentially the same area as a helicopter today. So we can take advantage of helipads that may already exist in the cities that we start to operate from day one. At the same time, we've begun in conjunction with both regulators and commercial real estate partners to work through the provisioning of new infrastructure that would densify. Um, a network beyond the existing helipads that are already out there. And one of the things that we have going for us, Tom, in that effort is that we spent a lot of time on this aircraft to ensure that it was very quiet. Um, so that's 100 times quieter than a helicopter at flyover, 10 times quieter during takeoff and land. And the reason why that's important is that the biggest gate to uh, getting new helipads um, approved in various cities is mostly around the noise. All of the effort in New York to limit helicopter operations have been driven by community disturbance around takeoff and land. We knew that we would have to build a far quieter vehicle to get community acceptance for new vertiports. And we've now, through more than 10,000 flight tests, kind of proven what this noise profile looks like. So that has really changed the dynamic of our conversation, both with partners on the real estate side for new infrastructure and with the local regulators that would have to support them. And it's certainly strikes many people as strange to be both an aircraft manufacturer and an aircraft operator, but there actually are important historical analogs to that. In the very early days of aviation, the beginnings of commercial aviation, Boeing owned United. Um, and was the manufacturer, but also the operator of those vehicles. And it was only a, a strange antitrust suit back in the 1940s when they were getting government subsidies for airmail that broke apart the manufacturers from one side and the operators on the other. But in the very early days of new product introduction, a higher level of vertical integration may be important because there may not be an operator that can operate this vehicle in the right way. There are pieces of it that need to be put together to make that work. And we wanted to make sure that we designed the company and designed the approach to at least some of these markets um, to ensure that from day one. Again, Tesla analogs are, are always a little bit tricky, 
but it you can think about it as the same way that Tesla not only built their first vehicles, but also had to build a charging network in order to deliver the right value proposition to consumers on the other side. With any te new technology, there are, there are always hoops to jump through, whether that's climate or uh, around regulatory approvals. So can you just talk us through the, the process um, from a regulatory perspective? Sure. So in order to fully operate these aircraft uh, here in the U.S. and around the world, there are three pieces to the certification process. One, the type certification of the aircraft. Second, the production certification of the facilities that they're produced in. And then third, the operational certification. Um, we knew it from a very early stage that we would have to achieve each of those goals to get to um, uh, a sort of final service. And we had the advantage of beginning the conversations with the FAA very early in the program. So we had lots of opportunity to work with them to get to a sort of final rule set that we can then build and in turn test against. And it has helped in turn that this category, which has sort of variously been called urban air mobility or advanced air mobility, has gotten more and more attention out of DC. It was at one point, um, uh, a backwater that folks were not concerned about. But now I think they see that we are at a pivotal moment in aviation um, uh, in moving from combustion vehicles to now electric aircraft. And they feel, whether it's on the executive side, whether it's on the congressional side, that ensuring the U.S. is a leader in that next revolution is important. Um, so we've been getting a lot of lean from all the right places to help ourselves um, move as quickly as we can through each of those pieces of certification. I think the environment now is actually, from a regulatory standpoint, is actually better than I have ever seen it. In part because this category has gone from a backwater that people were happy to dismiss to now something that feels critically important in the US and the developed world for the future of aviation um, and has both geopolitical and geoeconomic significance. Could we touch on your partnership with, with Toyota? Um, they, they've been there with you f from, the, from the early days. Um, how, how, are they, how are they helping you? Why is that partnership important? So it began, as you noted, <clears throat> quite a few years ago, um, you know, before before the company became a public company, um, with what I think is still the largest automotive investment in any VTOL company anywhere in the world by uh, multiples, um, <clears throat> and alongside capital, they were also very excited and have delivered on real assistance in the design and scale up of the manufacturing program for the aircraft. So we have more than 30 Toyota engineers that are shoulder to shoulder with our manufacturing engineers at our facility here in California. We recently made an announcement around our next scaled production facility in Ohio. They will be shoulder to shoulder on both the design and execution of that effort. And the reason why it is important for us is that when we think about volume for these aircraft, you know, we are starting now with a pilot facility that can do tens of aircraft per year. The next facility is designed for hundreds of aircraft per year. At hundreds of aircraft, that is already one of the highest, the highest volume uh, production ramps of any aircraft in aviation history, maybe absent when they were rolling them off the um, manufacturing lines in Detroit or around World War II. So we need to think about production processes and production approaches that are closer to low volume automotive as opposed to high volume aviation from day one. So they've been a wonderful partner um, in this effort and we think there are opportunities to really deepen that relationship over the long arc as we get to higher and higher volume production in time. I think that our listeners will be listening to this and thinking this is sort of science fiction, flying, flying cars, you know, 
you know, how long are we going to have to to wait for this? But you you, you recently reached this really important uh, milestone of of actually delivering the first aircraft. So talk 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 to us about about that and and what it signifies. We delivered the first aircraft to our first customer, which is the U.S. Air Force, um, at their facility at Edwards Air Force Base, uh, close to Mojave here in California. That is. Uh, a critical milestone for Joby, and we think actually the industry as a whole, as it marks the first eVTOL aircraft delivery to a customer anywhere in the world. And it is a critical piece of, I think, showing the public that, yes, uh, uh, flying cars, the sort of Jetson future has been talked about for a while, but in fact, it is happening right now. Over the course of the next 12 months, You will see more and more aircraft, not just doing testing at our facility, but out there operating in the real world against missions that are important to that particular customer. And that's really important for Joby because we're going to learn many of the things that we need to learn for commercial service well ahead of actually having to execute on it. And I think it's also going to be really important for the broader public to say, hey, this is coming. It's working. And um, they should expect it uh, in, you know, their town relatively soon. So, so we've talked about the early days, the product development, um, the regulation. Um, so, as we come to a close, let's let's take a, a step back. You are a pioneer in in this industry. Yeah. You know, what if what if the lessons you've learned from from pioneering an in industry you know, that that other that others other entrepreneurs might might get value from? I think, I think one of them is sort of what we touched on, um, which is that <laughs> uh, every overnight success that people hear about um, often has a long um, and very, a, a longer backstory than people appreciate. Um, there is a lot of work uh, before it sort of reaches public consciousness that is often forgotten um, in the sort of eventual winners of companies. And at least from an entrepreneur's standpoint, whether it's with Pinterest, in turn, whether it's with Joby, it's important to prepare yourself for a long time of working in relative obscurity um, before, uh, you know, before any sort of uh, success, if you're lucky enough to have it. Um, so that that is certainly, I think, uh, uh, an important lesson to take away. I think in terms of this industry in particular, however, um, It was really valuable for for Joby to have a long period of time to build successive versions of this aircraft before, you know, we've landed on the vehicle that we're now certifying and beginning scale production of. It is very difficult when you're building something brand new to get everything right. Um, And uh, we benefited greatly um, from you know, almost 10 years of careful iterative development across this aircraft. And I don't think it would have been easy to do it any other way. Paul, we, we ask all our guests the same final question. And I think for Joby, it's, it's actually particularly relevant. You know, what, what does the world look like if you succeed in delivering the company's mission? So I think we will... We will have quick, safe, quiet, green aerial transportation um, in many large cities and smaller cities around the world um, if we're looking out kind of 10 to 15 years. You will be able to do that trip from JFK to Manhattan in 10 minutes instead of the hour and a half that it might take you. Um, And you will be able to uh, get to places far more easily, like northern New Jersey to um, Connecticut um, at speeds that sort of are not possible right now, given cars on the ground and ground infrastructure as it currently exists. But scoping up, I mean, we think of the future of transportation as one that really has three characteristics. First, it is increasingly electric or green. Second, is it increasingly on demand? And I think you've already seen that move in ride sharing and other things. And three, it is multimodal. It's about getting you the right vehicle for the trip that you're taking. Maybe it's a car, maybe it's a scooter, 
maybe it's Adobe Aerial, Aerial Vehicle, or a series of those sort of stitched together. And those three things, I think, are the real promise of the future of transportation, a way to get people to where they want to go faster, uh, greener, um, and with just the right mode of transportation that they need at that given moment. It's a vision which I think is going to touch everybody's lives over the, over the coming decade. And I, I, I think it's just so exciting what you've what you've managed to achieve so far in this in this journey. So thank you. Thank you so much for for joining us today. It's been fascinating. Appreciate it, Tom. Thank you so much. So I think after your conversation with Paul there, Tom, our listeners are going to have quite a different perception of what electric air taxis are and how close to reality we are um, in this industry. Yes, um, I I always learn something um, when I when I talk to Paul and, and hopefully it was um, interesting for our listeners as well. OK, so in this season, we're going to finish off each episode by asking the managers the same five questions about their investment case. And so, Tom... I think the first question that will be of interest to our listeners is, how did you actually come across Joby in the first place? I have a colleague based in in San Francisco, so it came from some of the work that that he did. So, so thank you to Chris Evdeman. And I think you know, in another part of it in terms of of thought process is, you know, if you look at some of the the trends that have enabled Tesla as one of our big winners of the past. Then you know, it, from a mindset point of view, it takes you to well, what what else does what what other the products and industries could that transform? And the other thing is is following some of the people um, that that started in that organization that have then gone on to do different and interesting things at other companies. And then talking about people, I mean, we talk a lot about the importance of the leadership of companies, the vision, the ability to almost drive companies, you know, towards, you know, that that kind of opportunity. So from your perspective, what is it about Paul that makes him special, has those characteristics that you really look for in our investment cases? Well, I think what Paul um, has when he came to Joby is successful entrepreneurial experience. He'd been he'd been part of the founding team of of Pinterest. Uh, he'd taken on some of the challenges that 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 went with that business. And you know, he didn't have to, you know, go get back into the market and 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 work on building another business. But he had that drive. But he and he had the experience of of doing it the first time round. He was ready for an even bigger challenge. Um, and so I think that's part of what makes it special. I think it the other another part of it is the chemistry of of the broader team. So whether it's the the people in engineering, the people in in operations. Um, who who combine that those different skills um, that you need to get an get a um, undertaking like this off the ground? Paul referenced, you know, there's a number of players in this market, but Joby really seems to be at the forefront um, in terms of that path to commercialization. So, what is it about Joby? What's its competitive edge? Do you think that they have over others? Well, I think it's a combination of a number of things. So being early, he talked about this idea that you know they were overnight success after after ten years. So they were one of one of the first players in this. I think working closely with the regulators is another to understand what is the path to certification, um, because that is a really um, you know, challenging and important piece to get right. Um, but I think there's a number of other factors that are that are also quite intangible but really important. Um, the approach to raising capital. Yeah. Um, you, this this is a really capital intensive undertaking. How how do you think about capital raising both as a private company, but then transitioning into the public markets? How do you get the partners in to provide the right capital? How do you get the experience in both in the operating team, but also in the partnerships that they've had, whether it's with Toyota or Uber or Delta Airlines? Um, so it's it's all of all of those things. Um, and then maybe a, a final one to add is 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 working with the Department of Defense. So, you know, if you're on the path to a consumer product, but it's going to take you a long time to get there, what what are the ways that you can deploy the technology, test, learn, iterate, yeah. without but before you get to that that FAA approval stage? And I think just kind of the next step from there is you know with all of our investment cases, 
there is naturally risks and challenges. So what do you think is the most significant challenge that Joby has to overcome? Um, and, and how well placed do you think they are to overcome the challenges that they may face in that path to seeing them you know, operating in the skies above, above New York? Well, I think there's a, there's a number of challenges, but I think the the first and obvious one is around safety and certification. Yeah. You know, you, they have to have a product which is safe and is certified to be safe, and that is a, a huge undertaking in the modern aerospace industry, and it's existential. If they don't get that right, they will fail. I think from a from a business perspective, I think one of the big challenges is that they've had a singular focus, or almost a singular focus, um, since, since, the, since the inception of the business, which is to create this aircraft, um, you know, to design, um, find a way to manufacture and get certified this aircraft. But over the next small number of years, they have to pivot from, from you know, the, the, the goal changes completely, which is how do you manufacture this at scale and then how do you operationalize it? So, so you've got to see this transformation within within the business from, you know, fo- focusing on on design and development to scale up and operations. And and I think that for me is one is the is the big challenge of the next five years. And then, Tom, maybe just a final question. I mean, we talk a lot about the purpose of Scottish Mortgage is to identify one and support the world's most exceptional growth companies. You know, that is what we're trying to do. So how is the scale of the opportunity for Joby? How, how big could this be? You know, if you think about um, the number of passenger journeys that happen in modern cities and the amount of time that's lost to congestion. Um, and so the idea that you know, if, if they can drive down the costs of transportation from, from this mode of transport um, and the efficiency that it might bring, then you know I I think you know you're very rapidly if you if you think about how long the journeys are how you know how how many passengers you might have on each journey what the cost per mile might be you very rapidly get into an opportunity that's worth billions tens of billions um, so you know I I think it's such a universal need that it's an enormous market if they can get it right perfect thanks Tom. A big thanks to Paul Sciarra of Roby Aviation and to Scottish mortgage manager Tom Slater. Next up, we welcome the CEO of Moderna, Stefan Bansell. Moderna is best known for developing a COVID vaccine and being instrumental in getting the pandemic under control. Many might think this company is a one-trick pony, but tune in to hear how their technology could cure the most problematic viruses affecting human health worldwide. Moderna is a company we get asked about more than any other right now, so this is one you will not want to miss. You can listen to this podcast on all major platforms and hit follow or subscribe so you don't miss new episodes. Don't forget, you can also stream all episodes from season one and you can learn more about us at scottishmortgage.com. You've been listening to Invest in Progress. Thank you for joining us.